Today we will continue Unit 1 on Frequency Domain Analysis. Lecture 1-2, Operations on Signals and Singularity Functions. The objectives are to review operations on signals such as time shifting, scaling, and reversing, to review special signals such as unit step, impulse, rect, and sync signals. Signal operations graphical transformations. The following table provides a summary of the shifting, scaling, and reversion operations on signals. So first we'll do time shifting. Given the following signal x of t with t naught, if we wanted to graph x of t minus t naught, if t naught is greater than zero, this represents a shift to the right. If we wanted to plot x of t plus t naught, assuming t naught is greater than zero, this represents a shift to the left. Hopefully much of this section is going to be reviewed from your math courses. So what about time scaling? If we have y of t, notice that the boundaries are negative four to four. So if we have y of two t, that's actually compressing the signal. The way to think about it is that I know that it was a two, a one at negative four. So now that I have a negative two, two times negative two gives me negative four. So I still have to have the same one that I had before. So conversely, y of t over two is going to be a stretch, which means now at negative eight, I have a one because negative eight divided by two is negative four, which gives me the same original one. So here we divide the width in half and here we double the width. Time reversing. So if we're given the following signal z of t and we wanted to find z of negative t, this is a horizontal flip about the vertical axis. So what you see here is t naught now becomes negative t naught and the curve is the mirror image of itself. Given the following signal x of t, what is x of negative 2t plus 4? There are actually two methods to solve this problem and we'll look at both of them. The first method involves doing the flip first, then the scale, and then the shift. So x of negative t. you're now going to have negative eight here and positive six here. And this is still one and this is three and this is four. Next, we're going to find X of negative two T. X of negative 2t means that we're going to compress along the time axis. So I'll draw the sketch first. And now on the left we have negative 4. On the right we have 2 and 3. And the vertical values are still 1 and 3. So now we're going to do the shifting, x of negative two times the quantity t minus two. Note that x of negative two times the quantity t minus two is equivalent to x of negative two t plus four. So now we make our final sketch and this represents a shift to the right by two. So here's my shape again. And it now goes from negative two to positive five. This is four. And the height's one here and three here. 
The other way to solve this problem is a bit more confusing, but I want to show you options, so I will show it to you. Although I recommend that you use the first way that I did it. So the second way to do this is to shift first, then scale, and then flip. So first, you're going to have x of omega plus 4. We know that omega is equal to negative 2t, but I want to use omega to help you to see where you're going to make your shift. So that means you're going to take the original waveform and shift it to the left by 4. So here's the shape. And here I'm going to have negative 10, negative 8, 0, and 4. Okay, next we are going to scale. So we're going to have x of 2v plus 4. And remember, v is equal to negative t. But I want you to understand that the scale is going to be on this part here. So now the graph becomes a compression. So I'm going to have negative 5, negative 4, 0, and 2. And both of these have the same amplitude, 1 and 3. Then the final step is to flip. So we're going to have x of negative 2t plus 4. So now after we flip, we have the following shape. Negative 2, 0, 4, 5. And here's your amplitude 1 and your amplitude 3. And what you should notice here is they are the same. Now the last thing we want to do is to check our work. To check our work, what we're going to do is we're going to look at our final graph and we're going to get values from it. So my first column is going to be time and I am going to record the values from negative three to positive six. So, I have a column t and a column x of negative 2t plus 4. So, I record negative 3, negative 2, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. At negative 3, the value is 0. At negative 2, the value is 1. At negative 1, the value is 1. At 0, the value is 1. At 1, the value is 1. At 2, it's 1. At 3, it's 1. And at 4, it jumps to 3. At 5, it's still at 3. And at 6, it drops to 0. So now, I calculate the values negative 2t plus 4. So negative 2 times negative 3 plus 4 is 10. Negative 2 times negative 2 plus 4 is 8, and so on. So then I have 10, 8, 6, 4. Then I have... 2, 0, negative 2, and my last three values are negative 4, negative 6, and negative 8. So now, I go look at the original graph. And 
and I check these values against what I have here. So let's put the original graph on here. So now looking at the original graph, we see that at 10, we should have zero, and we do indeed have a zero. At eight, we should have a one, and we do have a one here, and we should have one at six, four, two, zero, and negative two. Six, four, two, zero, and negative two. Then at negative four, we should have a three. So at negative four, we do have three. And at negative six, we should have a three. And at negative eight, we should have a zero. So these values do check with the original graph so that we know we did this problem correctly. Singularity functions. Sines, cosines, and exponentials are all continuous and differentiable at every point in time. Singularity functions are related to each other with integrals and derivatives and can be used to mathematically describe signals that are discontinuities or discontinuous derivatives. The following table summarizes some commonly used singularity functions. The first one is a step function. The graph of the step function looks like a step, which is hence how, where it gets its name from. So we have a horizontal axis T. That's a zero. And then it steps up to one. Now this is the definition that we use for a step function in ECE 205. But we're going to use a different one in this class so that we can relate it to the signum function, which is coming up next. So we're going to change this to be the following. It's going to be zero for t less than zero, one half for t equal to zero, and one for t greater than zero. What you should notice here is it doesn't change the shape at all, but now it's going to make our signum function make sense. Because our signum function is 1 for t greater than 0, 0 for t equal to 0, and negative 1 for t less than 0, or I can write this as 2 u of t minus 1. So the sketch of the signum function looks like the following. It's negative 1. It's a 0 at exactly 0. And then it's a 1 at t greater than zero. Next we have our ramp function. Our ramp function is t, zero for t less than zero, and t for t greater than or equal to zero. Or we also call that t u of t. So the ramp function looks like the following, where this slope is one. The rect or the rectangle function is one for the absolute value of t less than one half and zero for the absolute value of t greater than one half. Or we can write this as u of t plus one half minus u of t minus one half. So it looks like a box with an amplitude of one centered at the vertical axis with limits of negative one half and positive one half. The triangle function is one minus the absolute value of t for the absolute value of t less than one and zero for the absolute value of t greater than or equal to one. This can be written as r of t plus one minus two r of t plus r of t minus one. And it looks like a triangle centered at the axis where this is zero, negative one, and one. And the horizontal axis is t, and the peak is 1. And finally, we have a sinc function. Sinc function is equal to sine of pi over t over pi t. So this is actually continuous and differentiable, but it's on this table because it's in this section. So here, it has the following shape, where this dies off. It has several nulls, so the peak is 1, and all of the null or zero crossings are an integer. So this is 1, 2, 3, 
four, and so on. And over here, this would be negative one, negative two, and so on. Hopefully we're still reviewing functions that you've seen in your prior courses. The next one is an impulse function. The impulse function delta of t is defined by the following conditions. Delta of t is equal to zero for t not equal to zero. And also the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity, delta of lambda d lambda is equal to one, which tells you that the area under the impulse is one. If g of t is continuous at t equal t naught, then the sampling property states that g of t times delta of t minus t naught is equal to g of t naught delta of t minus t naught. So if you think about it, the impulse function picks off that value from g of t. So here's a sketch. Here's your impulse at t naught. And here is g of t. So now, the only place where those two waveforms intersect is at t naught, and it's a zero everywhere else. So the result of that product should be one sample here with an amplitude g of t naught. Number three, the area under the impulse is one, and if g of t is continuous, it t equals t naught. The sifting property is, the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity, delta of g of t, delta of t minus t naught, equals g of t naught, the integral from negative infinity to infinity, delta of t minus t naught, which equals g of t naught, which we've shown here. Note that the derivative of a step function is an impulse function, and the integral of a step function is a ramp. Solve the following integral. The integral from negative infinity to positive infinity, delta of alpha minus t, delta of alpha minus two, d alpha. So if I make a sketch here along the alpha axis, I have one impulse at two, and one impulse that's variable based upon t, so it can move left and right. Similar to the prior example, what you should see here is the only time your answer won't be zero is when t equals two. So it's only non-zero when t equals two. So this is an example of the sifting property where you're going to have the integral from negative infinity to infinity. So letting alpha equal to you, we're gonna have delta of two minus t, delta of alpha minus two, d alpha, which equals delta of two minus t, the integral from negative infinity to infinity, delta of alpha minus two, d alpha. We know this whole integral here is a one so the answer is delta of two minus t, or when that impulse is at two. Solve the following integral. From negative infinity to positive infinity, cosine four pi t delta of t minus two dt. Here is another example of our sifting property. So this is the same as the integral from negative infinity to infinity, Cosine of four pi evaluated at t equals two. So I put a two here. Delta of t minus two dt. I can pull the cosine out of the integral. So I'm gonna have cosine of eight pi. The integral from negative infinity to infinity. Delta of t minus two dt. Remember the area under this curve is a one. So this becomes the cosine of eight pi. which is equal to which is equal to positive 1 what is delta of t this is called a scaled impulse and we will start looking at this by first looking at our rect with a width of delta and a height of 1 over delta so we know an impulse function always has an area of 1 
And we know that delta times one over delta is indeed one. And so that means that this left side is negative delta over two, the center is zero, and the right side is delta over two. So the limit as delta approaches zero becomes an impulse function centered at the zero. So what about the limit as delta approaches zero of delta of AT? Well, we know that multiplying by A is either a stretch or a compression. So we know that the left side now becomes negative delta over 2A and the right side becomes positive delta over 2A. So if we're going to find the area of that, we get one over delta times delta over A. And notice this is an alpha, but it should be an A. So the area is one over A. So now solving this first example here, we see that if I have the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of delta of AT, that equals one over the magnitude of A delta of T. So whenever you have a scaled impulse, the area under the curve is one over the magnitude of A. So this means if I have negative infinity to positive infinity delta of 2T dt, this would be one over two delta of T. Or if I have negative infinity to positive infinity delta of negative 2T dt, it's still one half delta of t. Or what if I have the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity delta of t over 3 dt? This would be 3 delta of t. Example 5. Solve the following integral from negative infinity to positive infinity g of t delta of a times t minus t naught dt. Okay? So once again, We'll make a sketch. So here we have g of t. And here we have our impulse at t naught. But I am going to put 1 over a next to it to remind me that the area under this one is actually 1 over a and not 1. And so you notice here once again, that there's only one intersection and it's at T naught. So the product of those two would be one value at T naught with a value of G of T naught over A. So now let's look at the integral. This is the integral using our sifting property from negative infinity to infinity, G of T naught delta of a times t minus t naught dt. I can pull the g of t naught out because it's not a function of time anymore. So I have g of t naught, the integral from negative infinity to infinity, delta of a times t minus t naught. And I know that the area under this part is one over the absolute value of a. So this ends up being g of t naught over the magnitude of a. Example six, delta of negative t. So what you should see here is that if I make a sketch, delta of negative t looks exactly like delta of t. So what this tells me is that delta of t has even symmetry. There is no difference by putting the minus sign or not putting the minus sign. Another way to think about it is thinking about the scaled fun impulse function, delta of negative t is one over the magnitude of negative one delta of t, which is simply delta of t. So even symmetry tells me that the impulse function is a mirror image of itself across the vertical axis. 
So now let's solve for delta of AT minus T naught. This can be rewritten as delta of A times the quantity T minus T naught over A. So if I make a sketch of this one, it's an impulse function at T naught over A with a magnitude of one over A. So I can write this as one over the magnitude of A times delta of T minus T naught over A. Okay, so far we've looked at impulses on the time axis. What about if I wanted to look at one on the frequency axis in Hertz? Well, I have delta of omega. And remember, omega is equal to two pi F. So I can write this as delta of two pi F. Using our scaled impulse property, that's one over two pi times delta of F. So here I have an impulse at the origin with an area underneath of one over two pi. So in summary, the scaling property states that delta of A times T minus T naught is equal to one over the magnitude of A delta of T minus T naught, which is a scaled impulse. But there are some special notes here. An impulse is not a function in the normal mathematical sense, so we must be careful how we use it. For example, delta squared of T is not meaningful, so we cannot compute energy in an impulse. And this concludes today's lecture on operations on signals and singularity functions.